Hi, welcome to this new model of the long-term perspective for a post-COVID economy. My name is Joel Rabinovich. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at Leeds University. My areas of research are uh, corporate finance and macroeconomics. And today I will be discussing about the rethinking of the firm for this post-COVID economy. And, special, and not only the rethinking of the firm, but especially the rethinking of the state capacity to influence, control and generate policies in terms of some of the recent trends we've seen involved uh, in big firms, big multinational firms. So in order to do that, I will briefly review the situation we had until the COVID crisis. So I think it's a good idea to first start by uh, even before what we have before the crisis started. So what I'm showing here, <clears throat> it's a picture from the from a fourth industrial facility around the 1940s. It's the Fort River Rouge Industrial Complex. And this is a quote, what I put in the uh, right side of the slide. It's a quote for, from a paper by Paul Krugman, in which he said that uh, this facility combined at a single blast, at a single site, blast furnaces, rolling mills, engine casting, body stamping, and assembly of complete automobiles. This plant was in effect a facility that ingested coke and iron ore at one end and extruded passenger cars from the other. So the idea I want to give you and transmit with this, <clears throat> with this picture is that these industrial facilities were self-sufficient and fully integrated places in which, in this specific case, not only the different components of the final good, in this case and, and the automobile were produced, but also even the steel that was needed to produce the cars were produced and also the glass that was needed to produce these cars was performed in these in these factories the situation which is <clears throat> which was characteristic of most of the 20th century will eventually reach an end with a, a series of, of revolution and technological advancement one of them, the decrease in the in the transport courts. So that's what you can see in the upper part of the figure, a decrease in the airfare and, and sea freight costs. But especially the situation will, I mean, the kind of integrated facility I show you in the previous slide will reach an end with the revolution of the <clears throat> in information and <clears throat> communication technologies. So as a result of this, this revolution in the communication technologies, you, you can see this huge increase in the, um, this terrific increase in the, in the dat data traffic that went, for example, from 100 gigabytes of traffic per day in 1992 to 100 per second in 2002, 40,000 per second in 2017, and it's, and it's expected to reach 150,000 gigas per second in 2022. As a result <clears throat> of this revolution in the capacity to transfer goods, but especially to transfer data from one country or, or on the other, firms were able to communicate easier and to coordinate the different stages of production much easier. So that's why or that's part of the reason why we, you went from this <clears throat> fully integrated kind of manufacturing complexes to a complete disintegration of production around the world. This is something that is usually referred to as the, the global value chains. So from <clears throat> this integrated place in which the steel and the glass was produced, as I showed you before, we went to a, a situation like, for example, in Dell or Lenovo, which is an, a network of different firms that come together to produce this final good, in which each different firm is specializing in, in, in a very small and tiny part of the final good. So in the case of Dell and Lenovo, both of them have more than 4,000 tier one and tier two suppliers all over the world. And you have even more extreme cases like the case, like General Motors, which has almost 20,000 tier one or tier two suppliers all over the world. 
Of course, this, um, his, this disintegration of production has benefits for, for this living firm. So, and, and the reduction, the cost reduction is one of the most important benefits. So in the left side of the, of the slide, I'm showing that firms are able to save around 50% of the final cost due to the disintegration of, of production. And you can see in the right hand side of, of the slide that 50% of those managers interviewed by this consulting film, Egon Sender, 50% either agree or strongly agree that the supply chain is the most strategic asset of the firm. So this is this can give you a magnitude of the of the relevance that this complex network of firms have for the, the leading firm. So what I would like to turn now is not so much to the positive consequences that it has for the living firm, but rather some some of the negative consequences that this process had for different stakeholders of the firm. And I will come back to those <clears throat> different stakeholders by the end of the module. So one uh, negative consequence, and, and I put it as a, as a race to the bottom, is in terms of corporate taxes, because with this possibility to move production to different countries, you will end up having different national states competing among themselves either to keep the firms in their own in their own country if the firm was already there or to attract the firm if 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 it wasn't there before. And as a result of that you have this this I mean this competition among different countries offering these firms to pay lower taxes and as a result of that you see this decrease in, uh, in corporate taxes uh, all over different regions from the, since the last uh, for the last 20 years. So this is one uh, race to the bottom. The other race to the bottom is related to the um, of is related to how the value of the product is distributed among the different um, the different constituents. So I'm showing here a figure by Timur and colleagues in 2014, in which they compare the situation of capital share, high skilled labor, medium skilled labor, and low skilled labor. And they compare two points in time, so 1995 and 2008. And the diagonal of the firm is for those cases in which that factor is in the same position in both years. If it's above the line, it means that it's in a better off situation, and if it's below, uh, the contrary. And as you can see, and each each dot is uh, an industry in one country. And as you can see, both the capital share and the high skill labor are in a better off position in 2008 compared to 1995. Whereas in the case of medium skill labor, but especially the low skill labor, it's in a worse of situation in 2008 compared to 1995. So first race to the bottom <clears throat> in terms of uh, the state capacity to collect taxes from these firms. Second race to the bottom for, from low skill and medium skill labor. We can think of a third race, which is not precisely to the bottom, but rather would be a race to the roof, which is uh, carbon emissions. Because of course, as you have this increase in the trade of different components of the product until it reach its, uh, its final shape, you will have an increase in the, in the transportation of these different parts. And as a result of that, also an increase in the carbon uh, emissions. This is one thing, so the, the figure 3.5.3, uh, but you also have an unequal distribution of those carbon emissions, because whereas the living firm that concentrates most of the, of the design and the, uh, and the marketing of the, of the final product gets most of the value added and a lower proportion of the carbon emission, those firms involved in, in the production will face the opposite situation. So a lower value added and a higher proportion of the final uh, carbon emissions. We can now turn 
to the, the, the question and to try to answer this question of how this benefits for the firm, for, for the owners of, uh, yeah, for, for, for the capital share of the firm, how are these, um, these benefits being used? And this is what I'm showing here in, in this, uh, in this uh, um, figure with different shades in different colors. This is only for a U.S. incorporated firms, U.S. listed incorporated firms. And you can see how the turquoise area, that it's capital expenditure, so it's money which is productively invested in plants, equipment, machines, etc., has had a lower proportion, and it's been compensated by an increased use of acquisition, so firms buying other firms, and also, so this acquisition is the orange area, and also the purchase of the firm's own share. So this is the pink shade area. So this purchase of firm's own share, it's uh, one of the most popular ways to benefit the share owners of the firm in, in the following way. Because when firms are buying back their own shares, the, the prices of those shares in the market is increasing. So if you are the owner of those shares, you will see that this thing that you own, this share that you own, is increasing its price, so you will be in a, in a better situation. So this is a way to give money to their share owners. And the final question before turning to the, the lessons we, we have learned from the crisis is, <clears throat> is to turn to which are the owners of those of those shares, so which are the those people which are benefited from this uh, buybacks of their own share, and this is what what I I'm showing in in this in this circle. So you have that fifteen percentage of the owners of these shares are foreigners, twenty percentage are pension funds, and sixty five percentage are households either direct, directly or through mutual funds and the like. But the, the issue is that these shares are very unequally distributed. So you have that the wealthiest 5% of household or more, own more than two thirds of all shares and the bottom 60% own just 2.5%. So that's in terms of wealth. And in terms of income, you have that 50% of households with incomes under 50,000 own just 9% of shares. So um, to, to sum up before turning to, to these lessons, we have a situation in which states are even to collect less and less money from uh, corporate taxes. You have a situation in which <clears throat> low skill labor is, is in the worst of situation due to the competition among different countries and, and, and different firms to attract these stages of production. And you also have a very unequal distribution of the profits generated by these activities. So this was the situation we had before the crisis arrived. So let's turn now to some of the lessons uh, I think COVID has shown in, in relation to, to these trends I, I've discussed so far. So what I'm going to do now is not so much to concentrate uh, about the effects that COVID uh, the COVID crisis had in terms of these global value chains, because this has been, <clears throat> or this will be discussed in, in other modes, but I'm going to focus more in the participation of these other stakeholders <clears throat> in the uh, in the benefits associated to firms activities so the first lesson is that i think we should take a, we should have a good dose of skepticism regarding firms willingness to change why because in august 2019 you have a group of the most important firms in the us who uh, JP Morgan signed, uh, participated of, of this, Amazon and General Motors. So this group of firms signed a letter in which they publicly criticized this trend by which shareholders are tend to be the most important stakeholder of the firm. So they were publicly claiming for 
a more open perspective and more open approach incorporating other stakeholders so most of the stakeholders we have discussed so far so state communities workers so this they signed this letter in august 2019 well before we heard anything about the covid crisis so eventually this and uh, the, the pandemic was a kind of a natural experiment to test how these firms that signed this letter reacted to the crisis. So this is what <clears throat> Tyler Wright, a professor at Wharton, did, and we had uh, what he found out. I'm going to read the lower part of the of the figure. So, for example, he asked, "Did signers give less of their capital to shareholders via dividends and stock buybacks?" No. On average, signers actually paid out. 20 percentage more of their capital than similar companies that didn't sign the statement. Another question. So did they lay off fewer workers? On the contrary, in the first four weeks of the crisis, Greg found signers were almost 20 percentage more prone to announce layoffs and furloughs. Signers were also less likely to donate to relief efforts, less likely to offer customer discounts, and less likely to shift production to pandemic-related goods. So in the end, signing this statement had zero positive effects. So I think this is an important first lesson. And the other lesson, so if the first lesson was about skepticism, I think the second lesson is more related to optimism, and it's related to the state capacity to influence some of these uh, of the trends I've discussed so far. Because in the context of the crisis, we have seen that some European countries have refused to offer bailouts to companies linked to ox offshore tax havens. So this was the case of France, Poland, Belgium, and Denmark, but also some non-European countries like Argentina. So this is in terms of offering bailouts. And we also see, we also saw in the cases of other countries such as the UK or the US, which directly forbid firms to uh, distribute dividends and share and buy back their share or pay bonuses if they were receiving this uh, bailout from their countries. So such as, so, uh, as they did, the, as, they, as states took these measures in relation to offering bailouts, <clears throat> we can also think of maintaining some of these measures for the future, I mean, not in relation to, to the bailers, but in relation to uh, offering subs some subsidies or directly in their capacity to change the law and affect some of, of these uh, practices related to tax havens and, and buying back their shares, for example. So um, that was the end of, of the module. I, I hope you enjoyed. I'm showing here some questions related to the, the things I mentioned so far. So I recommend to pause the video and think about this, um, <clears throat> these questions and then uh, start it again, because in, in the next slide, I'm going to, to show the answers. So I'm doing that in three, two, one, now. And these are the references I use in case you are interested and also in case you are interested, you are more than welcome to contact me. So thank you very much.